Welcome, Gloria and Marty, to Kiel University. It's a great pleasure to have you here, leading experts in the microbial host interaction community and world. Microbes are important. We learned that in the last decade and we learned it mostly because of your work. What, how did you get to learn that microbes are important, Marty? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Thomas, and thank you for having us here at Kiel Life Sciences. We appreciate it a lot. Uh, actually, people have known microbes are important for a long time, and we've, we've built on other people's work. Uh, um, the great biologist Stephen Gould said, we live in the age of bacteria as it always was, as it is, as it will be until the world ends, because the bacteria are the, are, are the center of all life on Earth. That's how it's always been. And so it's not surprising that <clears throat> every plant and animal on Earth has had to take into account uh, bacteria. They are competing with bacteria. They're cooperating with bacteria. It's very complex relationships evolved over, over millions of years or longer. What do they do with our own body? Why, do, why are they important for us? Well, our, our body is a composite of us and them, maybe in about equal numbers, the number of cells. And they, uh, we have outsourced many functions. They help us with digestion. They help us um, uh, with nutrition. They make vitamins for us. They educate the immune response. They protect us against invaders. They perform many important functions. And I guess not only in humans, but also in many other organisms, from plants to animals to us. Yes, uh, all the plants we use in agriculture have a strong dependence on microbes. All the animals that we use for food all have their own relationships with microbes. And we're at an early age. We're just beginning to exp understand this and explore it. And it has a lot of potential for, for, for humans. So now in 2014, you brought out a book, uh, which now is translated in 20 languages, including in German, uh, which has this striking title, Missing Microbes. So obviously these important partners are getting lost. How did you find out that they are getting lost and why are they getting lost? Yeah, yeah. so to me, it, it, it's a good title because it really, it says it all. There are microbes that normally belong there and, and they're not there anymore. That's why it's called missing microbes. Uh, I was studying a, a bacteria that lived in the stomach. It was the dominant organism in the human stomach, probably since well before we were humans. Uh, and now we see that gradually it's going away, fewer and fewer people. In Germany, I think uh, less than 5% of the children have it, whereas it used to be universal. It became clear that this was the normal organism and it's disappearing. And then I thought, you know, if one organism is disappearing, probably others are disappearing as well. That's how the idea started. And the more I worked on it, uh, the more and more evidence there was that this was in fact correct. So what is the consequence when microbes disappear? We don't see them, we don't feel them. What happens if they disappear in our body? As I said, the microbes are performing many important functions for us. They're, they're benefiting us. So when they disappear, we lose some of those functions, some of the education of the immune system, some of the effect, how they interact with nutrients. So we could predict if they disappear, some of the consequences will be good and some will be bad. And uh, I think all of us uh, in the last 50 years, we've concentrated, let's say, on how healthy we've become and how much better uh, it has been since we've won many wars against infectious agents. But now new diseases are arising like obesity and diabetes and asthma and allergies and inflammatory diseases uh, of, 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 of the gut, for example. So a number of years ago, I, I had the theory that the decline in our microbes is what's fueling the rise in these diseases. And now more and more, it, it, it's pretty clear that that's correct. So, I mean, this is a, you're a medical doctor. So there's, of course, a striking 
correlation with these diseases, uh, the number of diseases, and then your title of the book, The Missing Microbes. But can you tell us is, what is good evidence that there is a causal, is there a causal relationship or what is the best evidence we have so far to assume and to support your hypothesis? Yeah. So uh, there's more and more evidence that there is a true causal relationship. And w we see the evidence from uh, epidemiologic studies where we look at uh, groups of children who are born and have exposure to antibiotics or not. And then we see, well, what's the rate of disease development? And there have been studies now in asthma, in allergies, in juvenile diabetes, in inflammatory bowel disease, in obesity. All of these say that children who are exposed to antibiotics have more uh, bad outcomes. Now that could just be coincidence. Could just, correlation is not causation. But that's one part of it. And, and we also see that these diseases arose during the antibiotic era, when uh, antibiotics have been so widely used and overused. And so then we began to do studies in mice where we could do an experiment that would test a hypothesis, where we gave mice antibiotics or not, and then we asked what are the outcomes. And we have studies involving obesity in uh, immunological markers related to asthma and food allergies, inflammatory bowel disease, juvenile diabetes. All of these provide evidence that the antibiotics are changing the microbes that are living in the mouse's body and predisposing them to those diseases. And from those experiments, we can make the inference that the same thing is happening in people. So, Gloria, you are approaching the significance of the microbes from different and two very interesting uh, uh, angles. And on one side, you go to the jungle and you go to people um, which live outside any urbanization environments. And on the other side, you, get, you go to uh, um, rooms where babies are born and uh, look um, how does a newborn baby um, has microbes and what happens if the baby is born by cesarean section. So these are two different ways. You come to a very similar conclusion as Marty that microbes seem to be important and they seem to be ancient evolved partners with humans. How did you get to the jungle and to the idea that you visit the people living there? So I'm interested in understanding why are microbes disappearing and how much have they disappeared? So how much did our ancestors have that we, we lack now? And a, a good proxy for that is to go to uh, communities that live uh, very traditional lifestyles with no medicine, uh, no antibiotics, no C-sections. And these are survivors because they have reached adulthood uh, in, without all these tools that we have today. So we started comparing uh, ingredients of urbanization because the interesting things is that you can find these people living in their traditional lifestyle or getting closer to towns, the same ethnic group. So we have several of those gradients of urbanization, and we take three or four degrees of urbanization and compare them. Uh, that gives us an idea of how fast the process goes, what do we lose first, uh, what do they lose first, and then try to find functions also Again, using animal models is a very useful way to understand what functions were there, what functions are lost by comparison. What is the evidence in that approach that microbes are important? So there are, we try to study everything that changes with urbanization, and that includes environmental exposures as well as the microbiome and incidence of diseases. So what we see in general is when traditional peoples integrate into our culture, uh, they lose parasites, they lose diversity of bacteria, and uh, again, correlationally, 
they gain, they tend to be uh, overweight. Uh, the kids grow taller, faster, and they tend, they really have an increased risk of obesity. So the same disease, as Marty said, is in our Western populations. That's right. The same modern plagues, as we call them, uh, the diseases of modern societies. So there seems to, there is evidence that we seem to be trading diseases. We control infectious diseases as we use medicine and become more urban. Uh, but then we increase the risk of the diseases that have the underlying uh, inflammation mm -hmm. as a common factor. And if microbes are respon responsible for that, in a way that's good news because we can manipulate them and we can restore. Uh, now there is a lot of uh, research needed before we know what to restore and how. Uh, in the urban side, um, we also study the different impacts and what are the impacts? Is only antibiotics or what about being born sterile and acquiring abnormal sets of bacteria like C-section born babies? Can we restore them? What happens when we expose babies that are born by C-section to a natural, the natural inoculum? How do bacteria engraft? Eventually, we want to know what's the implications for health. Are they protected? So all this research is needed to really understand why have we lost such an important proportion of microbes mm -hmm. and why is that important? Microbes are important players and they were always important players. Now, Marty, uh, your book, Missing Microbes, focuses very much on the role of antibiotics, which were invented as a very important life-saving uh, drug but obviously are key players in this losing our microbes. Yeah. So in, in, in the United States, and probably in Germany as well, in 1900, infections were the leading cause of death. And since then, we've had tremendous improvement. The rates of death from infections have gone way down. But in fact, 80% of the decline happened before 1940 before antibiotics were invented. That decline was because of improved sanitation, clean water, vaccinations. And we've had improvements since 1940. That's the age of antibiotics. But the antibiotics are almost secondary. And yet that's also the time when, now when these diseases have arisen. Some microbes are getting lost and we will miss them. Um, is that urgent problem? I'm afraid it is because there's more and more evidence that with each generation, we're stepping down. We're losing microbes rapidly. I, I think that our, our changes, this microecological change, is happening even faster than the macroecological change of climate change that we're all aware of. I think it's happening faster, and that's why it has to be urgent. So the World Health Organization uh, estimates that from now on, all growth in human populations will be urban only. So that will make a world that is highly urban. At the same time, we observe every year when we go back to the traditional communities, how they, they are moving to towns. So it's a matter of decades before they will not be any more traditional peoples on Earth. We have to save those microbes before they disappear. Yeah, interesting. So obviously microbes were always important as your work shows and they are important today. And obviously also we lose them. Now, Gloria, you had recently um, suggested a very intriguing initiative. What can we do? Can we counteract that loss of microbes with some, somehow? And uh, you invented uh, with a number of colleagues and supporters the so-called Microbiome Vault Initiative. Can you tell us a little bit what that means? How did you get to that idea and what it really means? So when, when we look at the data and when we see how fast year after year we go back to these communities, mm -hmm and we see how fast they are integrating in our westernized modern lifestyle, and we see how microbes are being depleted. Uh, 
we have the urgency to, especially not knowing what the functions that are being lost are and whether they are important for us and, and why, uh, it seems uh, an urgent, it, it appears a very urgent need to save them. We have to say, preserve that biodiversity until we understand the functions. That is extremely urgent because understanding the functions will take years, will take years of research. Uh, by the time we find out why they were important, there might be very few of these traditional peoples left. So uh, inspired by a very um, successful project called the Seed Vault, uh, by which, for a very similar reasons, agriculture has been depleting the natural diversity of plants and seeds. Uh, the initiative of the Seed Vault created a vault in the Arctic, uh, in Svalbard Island, to preserve the natural biodiversity of seeds that have uh, been produced by evolution uh, by nature and that agricultural uh, activities are killing. <clears throat> so we, uh, I thought we should be doing the same with microbes. And I first contacted them, the Seed Vault, and soon after, a team of excellent scientists, uh, foundations, um, um, Manuel Frankhauser from the Sea Rave, uh, on the part of the foundations were very enthusiastic about the idea. On the uh, scientific team was Marty, Rob Knight, Jack Gilbert, yourself, Thomas, uh, and other people very enthusiastically trying to uh, devise, uh, uh, design a way to save the microbes. Uh, in, we are now in the state of the feasibility study to do that, uh, but I think there is a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, in many ways, our urban life, our uh, activities in modern uh, lifestyles are perturbing nature, both at the macro level and the micro level, in ways that are going to be very detrimental for human health. So we need, we need to understand why and how to stop it and continue optimizing health, because what we want is to use technology, respecting biology. How should we understand this microbiome vault? This is a storage room in the Arctis, or how, how you envision, how should that happen? And you, you collect microbes, or you collect feces, or you collect tissue, and then you put it in a storage room, in a single room, or uh, can you say us a little bit more technically, how, what's your vision, how that should be? So it's a very complex and global effort. It doesn't depend on a team looking for microbes and putting them in a cold place. It's, mar it's much more complicated. The ultimate backup storage is one vault, uh, or two maybe, uh, in a cold place, in a safe place, uh, well supported. But it really relies on a base of uh, network of institutions and countries that are the ones that search for the uh, microbiota locally and regionally. So we account on a network of regional collections um, that then will donate to the central vault for long-term storage. But the regional collections are the live entities uh, local people, local teams, every country in the world has a university today. So we, we should really harness that uh, potential and collaborate with them for them to have their own collection to look for the samples in their local or regional environment, preserve them there and donate to the vault and at the same time engage in research with rich countries that are poor in this microbial diversity. So we need a, it's really a global effort uh, that is needed to end up having working collections, doing research, and having a backup or two uh, of safe long-term storage. Uh, that 
sounds as a fascinating um, endeavor, and um, you proposed your ideas in Science Magazine. Uh, and I think the scientific community is, uh, is endorsing that very much. Um, for me, it seems that it needs a very complicated governance structure uh, to control and to, to organize uh, that. So, I mean, I, I don't think that universities will be able to control um, this, this, these walls. Um, regional centers are certainly um, important, but then you have your central central storage. So, how you th is there any ideas already about the governance of such a global initiative? You are now thinking really big. Yes, uh, fortunately, we have the seed vault that went through. They it took them thirty years mm -hmm. to create what they have today. And they came out, in a way, they have a lot more resistance because they, they, are, ta they are dealing with seeds. There are powerful economic interests behind. Uh, the microbiome is just beginning, and it doesn't really hold um, big economic value, or there are big companies opposing the initiative. Uh, the way we think it might work is it's just like a bank. It, when you have a bank, and you put your money, you are the only person who can take the money back. Mm -hmm. So if the depositing entity is, has the rights over the deposit, that overcomes a lot of legal issues and right issues. And we think that's the way to go. The legal part uh, and governance is, uh, is being now uh, studied by the feasibility, independent feasibility study team. Uh, I think the seed vault continues being an example. And as they did, we need to really convince big governance bodies like the United Nations, WHO, countries, govern, you know, politicians uh, to contribute. And there are ways to navigate, especially if you have the right on, on the collection you deposit. So one last uh, word to more technically, um, what is really stored in these regional centers or in the, in the central storage, in the central vault? What is, are these single microbes or is that tissue or what, what, do you, what do you think you want to store? We think because we don't know how to culture, that's something we have learned. We are very bad at culturing and we need to improve. We need to devise uh, high-tech methods of doing high throughput culturing and detecting single cells and growing them, we are still very bad at doing that. And um, so we need, we think the specimens, the original specimens are very valuable because they hold the biodiversity of a sample. So we are planning to store specimens, fecal samples, skin swabs, nasal, uh, you know, all mucosal specimens that we can obtain, uh, usually because it's mucosa, it's a non-invasive uh, procedure, swabbing, uh, and fecal samples. And then any microbes that are derived from those samples that can be stored are, are also valuable uh, with the metadata. So it's also very important. The metadata part is co very complex. We need to associate each sample with a lot of information about the sample. Where is it from? Uh, if it's an isolate, what do we know about the isolate? Has it been sequenced? Do we have the whole genome? Uh, what has been done with it? So it's a very, it's a lively, permanent um, process of storing information as well as materials. Uh, and that has to be product of research. And that's where the universities through grants, researchers uh, will propose collaborations. That's the way we devise it. So if I go tonight in the city hall to, my, uh, to, the, to the public people and I, I want to tell them uh, I have met two interesting and uh, fantastic um, scholars in the field, what should I tell them in one sentence? What is the Microbiome Vault initiative? Gloria and Marty. So the Microbiota Vault Initiative is, is an initiative uh, that looks for 
preserving the microbes from all peoples in the world uh, until we can study them and understand how can we use them to restore health in future generations. Maji? The Microbiota Vault has been compared to Noah's Ark. According to the story, uh, a great disaster happened, but some people were prepared, and they saved something for future generations. That's the plan here. We're worried about this disappearance, and, and we want to save materials, preserve them, so that future generations will have them. So now you are also a medical doctor, and uh, so now we have learned that microbes are important, that for some reason we lose them, uh, that there is now an initiative which wants to store them. What is your vision and maybe hope as a medical doctor? How can you use them then in a medical, medical environment? Part of the reason to save the original specimens is that not only can't we culture some of the organisms that we know about, mm -hmm. but it is very likely that there are microbes in there that we don't, haven't yet been discovered. If we look at the pace of discovery in the last 20 years, all kinds of new microbes are being discovered. And that's not going to end. So we have to have a repository so that we can go back and, and look for new ones as, as they are being discovered. And ultimately, the goal will be to give them back to people, especially to children. All of our work, uh, and that of many other scientists, looks at early life as the critical period when the microbiome is being acquired and where it's interacting in the most fundamental ways with human biology. And the, the, the problem because of the missing microbes is that uh, there's miseducation. So we want to find the key organisms through research, define what are the key organisms, and now give them back to children. That maybe there will be some microbes that children all over the world will need. Key, key organisms. And there might be some that only some children need uh, based on where they live or what's their genetic background or other factors. And that's what I predict will be part of the medicine of the future. That, that doctors will examine the children and try to decide what they need, and then those microbes will be available, maybe from the vault, maybe from other sources, uh, and they, uh, they will start to give them back. That, that will be the medicine, uh, an important component of the medicine of the future. What an incredible, interesting, and important initiative. I want to congratulate you, and I also I'm very proud that Keele University is part and very little supporting that initiative. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. So much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your support. We really, this is a global effort, and we very much appreciate uh, your efforts and the efforts of Keele Life Sciences to make this actually happen.